of introduction. My name is Isaac Iwosho. I'm an adjunct instructor here at Oakland Community College. I'm, I, I'm a recovering tutor. I like to describe myself as such. Um, I'm also, uh, I teach writing courses and composition, the, um, the first sequence and second sequence. So I'm talking about 101, 102. I've also taught, I've also taught composition um, uh, and, and developmental composition. I started out as a tutor over six years ago at Loyola University and tutoring exposed me to a wide variety of needs that I, that I was just discovering in students writing. I'm interested in ESL, um, especially how students um, use, can use their cultural experience, cultural background, language, and speech, um, how, could, how they can use this as, as an asset um, um, in writing and speaking. I'm sure many of you will see how some of my various interests spill out in, the, in this presentation today. Now, my other interest in first year writing courses um, includes argumentative writing. Um, you guys will see this. Um, my experience, um, my background, my major in undergraduate in undergraduate school um, was philosophy. Um, so you 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 will notice this um, when I teach writing. I like I teach uh, when I teach advanced writing. I like to focus on argumentative, um, you know, the argumentative side of writing. I teach at Harper Community College as well, and I should mention that uh, this presentation is inspired by a class I taught at Harper College, not actually Oakton College. I should also mention that I'm curious about uh, Gen Zers or Gen Zs um, who make up most of my <laughs> composition classes. I'm interested in how they communicate with digital tools, um, how they use social media apps to communicate. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a presentation coming up um, it's at the Southern Modern Language Association in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. My presentation is gonna be on Snapchat and um, student group work. Um, if you're just joining, I want to welcome you all. I do want to emphasize that um, there is there is a background to this, and I would I would mention that when I when the pandemic started, I I I, I was thinking about how I could could include um, what students would be thinking of into my lessons um, when I was when I submitted this proposal um, debates about Max. Uh, wherein arguments for getting inoculated with COVID-19 vaccines. Um, those were the major trends that I that I that they were circulating the airwaves. Um, businesses reopening um, and the arguments why why some place some businesses should reopen or some businesses in certain locations should not reopen. This was this this, this was what I was hearing in the news. Um, so I planned some of my lessons um, um, to to incorporate certain events. And, and I, I felt that most some of these events would leave an impression, or probably already left an impression in the minds of our students. And I'm going to go over uh, my, to talk about in, what inspired me to start this, to, to, for, for this, this presentation. I, during the, during um, sometime earlier this year, I was, I was listening to a lecture and it's from, um, a Harvard professor of philosophy. His name is Michael Sandel. And he, he is, he is very popular. He's perhaps uh, the most popular um, philosophy professor at, at Harvard University. He fills out lecture rooms, as you guys can see. And um, he was talking about pandemic ethics. Um, pandemic ethics, now it's about the big questions, sort of like the political, social, the cultural questions. Like, what do we do in the, in the height of the pandemics? How should we lead? Uh, what is acceptable? What is right? So it's pretty much open for debates. And uh, Michael Sedell mentioned the key phrase, pandemic ethics. And so I talked about the phrase, pandemic visual analysis. I 
I do want to review the agenda. And I'm going to mention that in this agenda, um, I promise you that we're not going to be focused on COVID-19. Um, you've heard a lot about it. We will touch on it briefly, but that's not our main focus. I will talk about trauma and writing. There's going to be an activity um, on pandemic visual analysis. I am also going to discuss uh, vi visual li literacy, which is related to um, pandemic visual analysis. I'm also going to talk about the definition and um, how I choose to define pandemic visual analysis. I'm going to talk about classroom experiments, especially one I did with my students. Um, and then I'm going to talk about cross-cultural implications and visual analysis and, and also rhetorical awareness and visual analysis. And because we're, we, we're now, we, we many, many, some of us are back to um, to face-to-face to -face class teaching. And I, I taught it right to also discuss about post-pandemic visual analysis. And I do have some questions and hopefully you guys have questions to ask. My, I do want to emphasize that in talking about this, um, I will, there is going to be an activity. Um, and, I, and this activity is to just see what you guys are thinking of, what you have in mind. Um, and these are the instructions, just to, if any of you are new to um, Zoom polls, I've tried to simplify this. I'm going to launch the poll. I don't think it should take more than a minute to complete. But I'm going to be flexible and, and before I end the poll, before I share the results. And I'm going, to, I'm going to launch the poll. And so just to keep you guys posted, um, um, I did not think it should take more than one minute. Please try to complete this poll. Um, no right or wrong answers. OK, so get ready. Can any of you guys um, see the poll? You can, so I started the poll. Um, try to, once you're done, just submit. Okay, seems like we are all done. I'm gonna end poll and share the results. Wow, this is like a tie. So most people, um, well actually half of the participants are visually inclined and the other half are uh, kinesthetic inclined. And I have to say that um, uh, just revealing that I, I myself am kinesthetic. My learning style, um, so I was told by uh, a, an instructor, a, a music instructor, is kinesthetic. Um, and I discovered this several years ago when I was learning how to play the keyboard. He looked at me in the eye and pointed and said, you are kinesthetic. And I was like, whoa, I've always thought I was visual, uh, visually inclined in my learning style. But I've come to realize that this is, I'm kinesthetic because when, I'm, when, I, um, I, when I attend a webinar, which by the way is so boring, um, I find them so boring. I can't just, I can't really focus. And I, and one way I compensate for that is just by taking a couple of notes. And then I would look at keywords and then I would try to like uh, make sense out of these keywords or phrases um, and, 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 all, uh, and other details. And that's how I make sense of what, of lecture or you know, doing especially information that I receive during a webinar. Um, it, um, I should mention something about, about, uh, Learning, visual, learning, visual, learning styles, um, not everyone agrees with um, learning styles, like the way it's conceptualized. Um, 
um, that why is just three learning styles? Um, why can't we have more than, for instance, more than just, uh, just all these? Should we focus on the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic? Um, it's been criticized by a, a, a professor from Harvard, um, Howard Gardner, who talks about multiple intelligences, and there are eight of them. Um, so, on, so we have the visual, the musical, we have the, um, um, the bodily kin kinesthetic, and the personal, verbal, linguistic, logical, mathematics, naturalistic, and interpersonal. And now, um, God, Gardner's um, view of regarding is that we shouldn't be caught talking about learning styles. We should focus on how we can individualize um, learning. Um, we need to talk about multiple ways we can engage students. We can, we can, we can, we, and, and, and if it has to, if it, if it means like using different tools, different keys uh, to support students, so be it. And so musical, visual, um, we can use, we can borrow from nature. We can, we can, we can appeal to logic. And so it's so broad and which is why I like it. And many education, education, um, ed, uh, many, many education, education advocates um, have, and it's, it's embracing K-12, I've embraced multiple intelligences. Um, I, I brought this up because we're talking about visuals and um, if you have one or more lens, and it seems like we just have visual and kinesthetic. Um, and the other, I wanna talk about the second result. Well, it looks like most of us, again, this is, is evenly split. For some of us, it's powerful. For some of us, it's bleak and sad. Um, one person said provocative. Another person said constructive. Um, if I could take the poll, I would have chosen constructive. Um, um, and this, I, I, I thought is interesting because um, as I see this um, in this, this presentation, um, like I said, it's not to provoke negative sentiments or emotions about the pandemic. Um, I wanna clarify this because the phrase pandemic visual analysis still needs to be defined. Um, but I will get back on, on, on my preference. Um, no right or wrong answers at this point. Um, it could be offensive, it could be bleak, it could be sad, it could be constructive, depending on, on how we view um, the pandemic um, or how, what, we, what, we, what we think of the pandemic. Now, the third question is, uh, suppose you could only make a choice between teaching with words or pictures, which one would you choose? This is interesting. Um, majority said pictures. One person said words. Wow. And I, I would like to ask at this point, uh, why pictures? No right or wrong answers. I'm just curious. Anyone wants to share? If not, uh, we'll, we'll discuss. But uh, I, I appreciate all the, uh, all the answers, the responses. We're going to move on to the next. I do want to clarify a few things. Um, and this, it's more like a, a disclosure as I start this presentation, as we proceed, I want to mention, okay, so there's a chart, somebody said, professional reality. Okay, that's good. Um, I like that re response. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I, I just looked at the, I just looked at the chart, so I'm seeing this. Okay, that's good. No right or wrong answers. Um, I have a reason for that. I, I thought about that question and I was like, okay, I would have chosen words because as an instructor, there is no way I can teach with pictures. I'll be out of work if I, I can teach with, with pictures. I have, to, I have to teach students how to write and how to read. Oh, you know, so pictures is like, I don't know. It's just, it makes my work. I don't want to say anything at this point, but as an instructor, English instructor, teaching visuals, okay, this is good. <laughs> Uh, we'll get to discuss this, Rebecca. Uh, but I do want to go over the preamble to this presentation um, to clarify the misunderstanding and to also um, limit the scope of this presentation. Um, in this presentation, I am going to be focused on visuals, but my my goal my goal is to to discuss and explore um, various ways that we can enhance students. Um, Students' voice, students, um, students, um, students' rhetorical awareness. Um, in which we're in the pandemic age or post-pandemic age, 
And um, it's not going to be about um, the, 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 the gory, the, um, the gloom and doom images of the pandemic. Um, I, I would talk about some experiences in the classroom. Also, I mostly inter, when last semester, I was mostly interacting with ESL students um, who come to me for tutoring services. And I, and I was, I'm also an instructor. I have students who are ESL and students who are non-ESL. So I combine this experience in my discussion. So I do not particularly select one class or a particular student. So please be aware that this is, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my broad experience, which is not limited to one person, one class or one individual. There is, I don't know anyone who's seen this movie, but I thought it, it, it um, it, 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 in the movie, um, there was uh, this character played by um, Juliette Binoche, um, fired the first salvo that words are lies. Um, she told um, Cleve Owen, played by um, Cleve Owen, who, who was playing the role of, uh, of Ma Mr. Marcus, uh, an English instructor. And he responded by saying, a picture is worth a thousand lies, and we, as and and as you'd expect, there was this competition between the two and to prove the, which the supremacy of words, or is it a, or do we have is it the supremacy of pictures? And so there was this rivalry, and um, and I just thought it was interesting. I when I saw this movie, it was not long ago, um, and I brought this in because we're talking about words and we're also talking about visuals in the pandemic age. Um, we, are, we, we are being exposed to different elements. Um, here's a picture that some of us might have seen. Um, it went viral. Um, it, was, it was released by George um, Steinmetz. Um, he it's, it's circulated on Twitter. Um, he got cited for this picture. His drone was confiscated by the New York State um, police. And it's, it's about a mass uh, COVID-19 variants on Hart Island, Island in New York. Um, well, what's it about uh, images about um, the pandemic that, um, or, or that, that the government didn't want us to see, for instance, uh, in New York? And um, here's what Sarah Elizabeth Lewis, an art historian at Harvard University said. Um, so visualization is a powerful tool. It can help us more deeply understand the severity of the situation as we work to curb the virus. Okay, that's one way of looking. But what about, and this we're looking at images now, but what about, what about text? What about words? Um, this I thought was interesting. I was looking at this up. I also looked up more um, sources yesterday. During the height of the pandemic, many news organizations broke records, viewing records, readership records, um, the BBC, ITV, Sky News, even in the United States, um, many, 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 many readers were, were drawn on traditional readers, like we had a lot of young folks who were seeking information, who, who don't even consult traditional sources like, uh, like paper. Um, they, they, were, they were drawn to news uh, websites or, or the TV. And, um, and so why is that so? Um, well, it turns out that there's a psychology behind this and it's, 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 it's by design. Um, many of these news um, websites, uh, many of these news sources, they were provoking or uh, negative sentiments. Um, you can, well, of course, it's about COVID-19. So we had the news and everything was, it was just about what was going on. So words like trauma, words like, what's lockdown, outbreak crisis, as we can see on the left side. Um, this became frequent words we heard a lot in the media. Um, and I have not forgotten the theme of these, this conference. Uh, we were talking about trauma and, influ um, and um, trauma, infusing trauma-informed care into the Oakton experience. Um, I read this article and I'm going to post information concerning, if, there's, if those of us who want to go ahead, um, I'm gonna post the information on, on how you can stay. Okay, this is the, that's the link to the um, presentation, the PDF format. But I have other sources which I'm going to share at the end. 
um, you guys can access that and see where this is going. Um, but, um, oh, maybe I shouldn't have posted that because anyway, it doesn't matter at this point um, because I would just, I'm just reviewing because I have some activities and discussions there. Um, but um, if you if you want to if you want to go ahead, if you want to stay ahead, uh, or keep keep ahead of this presentation. Sure, go for it. Um, now, um, when it comes to the pandemic, uh, or especially when it comes to um, trauma and this, I, I the research I've done um, in looking at um, looking at visuals, the pandemic. Uh, pandemic visuals uh, could mean different things, like I mentioned earlier on. Um, many Americans um, are still recovering from it. Um, but then some people are coming out of this and they're not okay. Um, so we're talking about our students and our Oakton informed um, trauma, trauma in, infusing trauma informed care into the Oakton experience. Um, it's not so pleasant when it comes to students' experience and trauma. Um, We would mention, and, 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 and this, this went viral, how is it possible that students who are impacted by, by the pandemic have been traumatized? Um, and there is a debate about um, trauma. Um, it, currently, the debate, the, the, the definition as is understood by, in, in, by in the professional definition includes severe um, accidents, sexual violence, or maybe experience with death. And then some have argued that yes, High distress can qualify as trauma. And the question is, are students, did they, did they experience distress due to the pandemic? Yes, um, I have, I have uh, research that supports that. Um, and many young folks are very vulnerable to depression. Um, and they're in terms of uh, writing and um, trauma. Um, I got this from a Taika, um, Taika um, let me find it. I'm trying to find the her name is um, Melissa Tales. Um, and this was an interesting point that she made about how we can respond to foundational principles um, given to writing instructors. Um, so one is the buffering role model. And the second one is to create psychological, psychological safer classrooms. When I look this up, and um, so what does she mean by that? Um, she means she means that uh, um, for for the for the buffering role model, um, she was talking about resilience. Um, so instructors will model resilience. Um, I would display resilience. Um, and and what about the cycle and and regulation um, coping strategies dealing with trauma and psychological safety classroom? Well, that's about establishing environmental safety and preventing reoccurrence of trauma. Um, I'm, I struggle to understand what um, TLS means by these two phrases, because I think it puts a lot of demand on the instructor. Um, and I personally, I don't share like negative experience with students unless I think it's helpful, we can help them or inspire them um, in writing. Um, so I think this, this is our suggestions on how to deal with it. But I think the practical side of how to inform, um, implement trauma um, informed writing pedagogy would always remain in different disciplines, in different subjects across the discipline. Um, so that's interesting. If anyone is interested in further research, I would go over my reference and I can send that to you. Um, I mentioned about young people experiencing distress. I'm not gonna dwell too much on this. Um, the stats are out and many of us um, will have access to this presentation um, for the young people, especially those within the age of uh, 21, and we have 18 to, 9, to 29. Um, in, they experience high distress. And, um, if, and we have to take this into consideration because, we, because of our students at Oakton College. Um, we many, I work with a lot of Gen Zers, or Gen Zs, and I, I, it's not uncommon that I tell I, I students who tell me that they're, 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 they're having mental health issues. Um, so depression, um, um, trauma is real. We can talk about the debates of whether it's a capital T or a lower T. It is real. And this is the discussion. Um, as I go into this presentation, I do want to make sure that I briefly 
uh, talk about um, um, significant events. Maybe in the world, let's in the world, um, and maybe in the United States. So anyone can use the chart. This is going to be interactive. I'm not going to send anybody into the breakout rooms because I've learned from experience when I have presentations. When I send people to the breakout rooms, it's like sending people into the disappearing room. They don't show up again. Um, so I'm not going to do that. So any, you could use the chart, mention some significant events in the world that have occurred during the 2020 to 2021 period. Um, I know COVID-19 is pretty obvious. So if we were to say that, that's, that's something that um, I think many of us would know. Um, let's try to diversify our responses, not just COVID-19. Yeah, we don't like, what are some significant events in the world? I got one response. Oh, natural disasters. That is true. Daniela, that is true. Um, we've had earthquakes. We even had one from um, Haiti um, a few days ago. Um, we've had, what else? What other events? Okay, because of time, I would just chime in and just say a few things if, if no one adds any. Um, okay, we got another response. Immigrants who come from war zones. That is a brilliant one, Soraya. I, I, I actually have that in mind and, and I would discuss that. Um, immigrants who come from war zones. Thank you, that's a, that's a good one. Anyone else? Okay, um, so this is what I had. Um, I said word, but okay, what about the United States? Let's, let's, let's talk about the United States. Let's make this local. We can talk about other, other events in the world around the world. What about the United States? If you want to mention COVID, COVID-19, that's fine. That's acceptable response. Some significant events. And we're still in the pandemic. So because of our time, I would just, I would go going to, to just, so I thought of, this is obvious. Um, and if I could add a third one, um, that would be, I think there's some significant events still occurring, even in this age as we, as we move towards reopening um, society. Let's see. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, somebody got disconnected. Glad to have you back. Welcome back. Um, and I'm going to, for anyone who is just joining, I'm going to post. That's the link to catch the presentation. Okay, so we have unprecedented temperatures in the Northwest. Um, that's, that's also a good, I, I didn't even think about this example. So these are the two ones that I, I could think of. Um, Cause in my mind, when I was, I, I, I was, these were the ones that I could think of. And I know there were so many others, but the ones I just felt, this was the ones that I felt captured major headlines. And we still have, we're still, still being talked about the storming of the United States Capitol. And right now, um, you know, one significant event, this is global with the um, Taliban takeover of, of, of Afghanistan. Um, and we'll talk about that later as visuals. Um, this is what the four C's, the College Composition, Conference on College Composition, um, um, talked about, and co on Conference Composition and Communication, I always mess up the acronym. Um, so the four C's released this statement um, when we, uh, during the storming of the uh, United States Capitol by um, right-wing extremists, and this, this also motivated my presentation. So how can we, and I, I highlighted key, key words and phrases, as literacy educators, we have a moral obligation to cultivate rhetorical awareness so that as communicators, students will approach harmful, hateful messaging with the means to discern the distinctions between facts and lies and the motives at work in diverse rhetorical situations. Um, and the forces released this statement and um, pretty strong straight statement um, that we as teachers and scholars have a duty 
um, especially with those teaching teaching scholars of rhetoric and writing. And I need to define pandemic visual analysis before I go over some examples that I have. Um, if you do a Google search of the phrase pandemic visual analysis, you're going to come up with phrases like this, pandemic art, visual analysis, COVID-19 visual analysis hub, visual history of the pandemic. Um, as I've stated, um, it's, it's not my goal to go into um, various sad, bleak, provocative images. I do have a, a take on, 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 on what, I, what pandemic visual analysis is, or do we have chosen to define it for the purpose of this presentation? So by pandemic visual analysis, I'm talking about um, visual images related to specific socio-political events coinciding concurrently with the COVID-19 pandemic. It's the pandemic is not been declared over. So technically every event, major events happening um, local or global still is occurring within the pandemic. And so um, that's my working definition of pandemic visual analysis. What events, what images, what context, who is the audience? What writing instructions? These are some issues and these are some, some questions that, um, that I'm thinking of and probably some of you have in mind when it comes to the pandemic. So if you're just joining us, um, check the chart, you should find, um, there's a link to this a PDF of this presentation. So in defining visual literacy, now I must define this, or I, or I should appeal to various definitions of visual literacy, because in talking about pandemic visual analysis, it's not separated from visual literacy. Um, the different definitions of, um, of, of visual literacy, uh, but one commonality that I've seen um, is that they all try to, they all try to, to, to talk about different aspects of visual um, information. So we have the one from um, Bleed that talks about the ability to interpret and create visual media. What does that mean to create visual media? Um, we have another one from Felton, 28, around 2008. Uh, just as writing is essential to textual literacy, the capacity to manipulate and make meaning with images is a core component of visual literacy. Um, we have another one from Av Garino, Garino, this is a great name, um, in the context of human intentional visual communication and visual literacy. Visual literacy refers to a group of larger acquired abilities, the abilities to understand, read, and to use right images, as well as to think and learn in terms of images. Um, so everything is all about um, you know, visual information, visual education. Um, another one from Bromberger. I disagree with her on some on our perspective on visual literacy, and, and I would say why. Um, she has this definition, the richest definition of visual literacy includes both an interpretive and a productive component. Um, in other words, they stipulate the ability to analyze and interpret images and other visual materials. Though, although critical, it's not by itself sufficient for full visual literacy. It must be accompanied by some ability to create visual materials. So how does that fit into the learning? How does that fit into different objectives? Maybe in composition, maybe in ESL. Uh, there's a problem. Um, and this is just an activity. And this is an open question. Consider the image below. What are some interpretive perspectives um, a student might provide? Just looking at this image. Again, there are no right or wrong answers. This is just trying to anticipate how students could, would interpret this image. Um, it could be, uh, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to responses. You can use the chat button or just unmute yourself and speak. First, so let's just wait. A, let's give it a minute. 
Ah, huh. that's cool. Uh, thank you, Linda. I would expect that. I, I uh, no hands, socially distance. Yeah. This went viral. We had politicians doing this. Yes. Um, they're very diverse perspective. Yes. Yes. What about some contextual details? What contextual details might a student miss in trying to develop an argument? Again, there are no right or wrong answers. Um, it's quite, this is quite open. Wow. That's true. Yes. Yeah, so I'm getting various responses. And um, for, Gen, for, for, for Gen Zs, um, they, might feel, um, they, they may feel like they can adopt doing this more than shaking hands. And it, because it looks like it's cool, it's a cool way to greet people, um, and like maybe dabbing, you know, or something like that. You know, uh, students might actually miss out on noticing that the other, the other, the other guy here is not wearing a mask and is just, you know, greeting. Um, with his food. Um, so this is this is this is interesting. Um, different perspective. Um, but I'll give you. I'll let you guys know some of my. So this is some of my thoughts. And I, in, in showing students this image, I didn't. I, I've not actually showed my students this image. But um, I, I, I don't expect them to know that this is an informal greeting style that is used in China before the pandemic, um, unless they've done some research, um, maybe some thorough research. Uh, about the Wuhan, Wuhan handshake. Um, this was used in China many centuries ago. Um, and some of them might even miss the fact that Wuhan is the city where COVID-19 first uh, developed, emerged, um, and spread throughout the entire world. Um, but they perhaps are just focused on the grading technique. But the fact that it's called Wuhan handshake, would they, would they ask about why it's so? Uh, why it's been called that? Well, this had to do with the fact that it started, the greeting style started in, 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 especially during the pandemic in Wuhan, but it's not new in China. It's been there before. It's, it's, it's a mimicry of um, an actual greeting form that it's, that it's similar to um, raising the food up, raising and, and greeting. Um, so this is, this is something that students, I, I, would, I, would, I would not be surprised if many of them have seen this, it's gone viral. I also would expect many of them um, would say it's an alternative greeting, as, as many of you have rightly pointed out, um, introduced as a substitute for handshake or a hug during the pandemic, and it's a way to just stay safe. Visual literacy, I'm not going to go dwell too much on the facts of this, um, but if I were to mention anything, um, I would say that these skills are important. Um, some of some one 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 perspective I, I, I would like to highlight is critical thinking is limited without the use of imagery. It is impossible to do higher order thinking without using imagery. Um, I was I was thinking about and this this will lead me to one of my other discussions um, about um, approaching um, images, especially pandemic visuals related to events and how we can use this to engage students in arguments. I, I explore this especially in 102, which is focused on arguments. From the Journal of Visual Literacy, um, this is what was said concerning um, visual literacy and, and college students. So we know many of our students, especially Gen Z, are, 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 are visually inclined. They, 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 they are on social media. They have a, a high social media presence using Snapchat um, or Instagram and, and TikTok. Um, that's not, not, not new. And, um, but why does visual literacy matter? Well, this is a, a verdict that was issued by the Journal of Visual Literacy concerning um, students today. It included millennials, which to me is 
because I'm a millennial and we're just like, okay, I'm not like this, but I know many of my uh, Gen Z students are inclined to, um, to, 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 to do many of the things that I see here. I could be mistaken, um, but um, I do want to focus on key words that he said. Um, um, and, the, and I've highlighted um, a, key, a key section in this paragraph except, they do not know how to interpret or evaluate images and how to use them for effective communication. Another one is, the fact poses significant challenges to educators who often take students' competency in image production and critical evaluation for granted. In a world saturated by images, we are still more skillful in dealing with words rather than with visual imagery. Um, this, this is a, a, a very um, strong statement to say that students do not want to interpret or evaluate images. What criteria do we establish for them in order to evaluate images? And how can we say they can't do it if we don't, if we're not clear with the criteria that we give them? This can be debated. Um, and I do want to look at Oakton's, again, in, in the context of English 102, I focused on, 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 on identifying um, um, and applying strategies for planning, identifying and applying strategies for planning, drafting, and revising advanced expository. So when it comes to the goals of composition in 102, I tend to lean towards the argumentative aspect of it. And, and, and to do this, I try to um, make them write reflectively about, um, about images. Um, so they would, they would do some analysis, they would do some evaluation, but they also do some reflection. And I expect to see some summary too. Um, so I, this, is, this is how I try to meet the objectives of visual analysis in English 102. Um, when, I, when I started thinking about lessons on visual analysis, pandemic visual analysis, this is what I had in mind. I had some assumptions. It's not new um, that's, that, uh, uh, to talk about the pandemic, to talk about COVID-19, but I wanted to shift the yeah, focus away from the virus itself and the political grand call, the debates about Max and debates about um, um, social distancing, the debates about um, um, vaccination. And I was thinking about what is, what is happening, things that I could easily miss in the height of the pandemic. And, um, and these were some of the assumptions I came up with. I'm not gonna go through everything because of our time, because I want to reserve time for discussion. Um, but I do wanna focus the, on, on number four. Students may have some thoughts and perspectives about the pandemic images uh, they're coming into contact with, um, maybe from reading the news or from social media. And I thought a way to simplify this, to meet the to to uh, um, to help them or assist them or support them in learning is to provide students with heuristics for analysis and clear sets of instructions to aid them in the analysis and challenge um, their bias or prejudice to broaden their perspective. Uh, we can we can discuss this. I mean, many if any of you have questions about this, we will discuss this. Um, I do want to emphasize because I mentioned in in my in my at the start that this is also about encouraging students to develop arguments, and this is a model that that, that was developed by. He's a an economics, also a field uh, experimentalist from the University of Chicago. His name is John List. And this is how he, conce he, con he, con he, he, he conceives CT or critical thinking um, as a, he thinks of it as a pyramid, as a hierarchy. Um, so, so he believes the students, many students, 80% um, of students are in the model, model, um, model, model phase of thinking. So this is where you have preconception, um, bias, prejudice, status quo bias, argument by example, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's very developmental sort of thinking. Um, and then you have neophytes, as the word implies. Um, these are new to critical thinking. And so you expect them to, um, to confuse correlation with causation. Um, and then you have adepts, uh, those who, are, um, who seek to improve their own theory of mind, according to List. And then you have great thinkers. What he, um, and this, this, is, this is what I said, um, according to John List, um, would expect and appreciate intellectual confrontation. They're not egocentric. Those who are model thinkers are egocentric. They want to voice out their opinions and they don't want to be challenged or confronted when they say something. Um, 
But John Lewis also mentions that in his, and it's, this is, this is a, 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 it was published in 2021, um, that students do not achieve this great. No one is really, really here. It's, but everyone is, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are constantly learning and improving because they, are, they, they appreciate intellectual confrontations. So he gave one example that uh, John Liz provided in his, in his, in his article um, is to begin, and this again, this is talking about in context of economics, is to begin with this question, say, is there a value in putting yourself in one's shoes? And of course, there's gonna be an answer. And then he would introduce data, a few the experimental trust. And then after introducing data, he will give a issue a caveat and say many features can influence how people behave and experiment was on a few of those reasons for cooperation. And this is one way of slowing students down. Uh, and I have more resources to share with us. Um, uh, this came from, his name is Robert Bodjok. Um, I will share that resource. Um, and according to um, Robert uh, Bodjok, um, he, 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 he's talk about ways where we can slow, in order to slow students thinking down, um, it's, 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 it's an attempt to broaden, um, to, 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 to build memory, to build um, um, understanding and to build um, retention. Um, so, um, and, I, and I try to apply this similar concept, this, which, which is used by this for, for um, experimentalists into in, in my class. So this is how I try to slow students down when, when it comes to thinking. Um, I am going to, I'm going to share, I'm going to stop sharing because I want to, I want to share some. I'm going to put something in the chat button, a box. And you guys can take a look at that. So um, Robert Buck, um, Robert, uh, I can't pronounce the name, is, is he, I think it's um, Jock, Robert Jock, um, slowing down learning. And um, this is a, an interesting YouTube uh, video that I saw. Um, and he wrote an article along, I think that's his wife, learning and desirable difficulties. Um, but one thing I want to take away from this is that um, we can introduce um, different techniques through through tests, activities, uh, in slowing students, just to slow students down in, in, put, in pro providing a response either to a picture or to whatever we, whatever discipline. Um, and, and this is good. The argument is that uh, when doing this, we help them with build uh, retention and understanding. And, and this is what I try to do. I have adapted this in, um, and I experimented with this. It, there, it was botched in my class because, and the reason why, why it, I wasn't successful in this, it was because of timing. I made a mistake with my um, with my calendar, and students picked it. I'm going to discuss what I did. Um, so this is this is one example of how I um, this again. I need to make this practical in order for you to see what I did. So I gave students. So these were some visuals. This was this is a collection of visuals that I used in my one or two class. So I gave students. Um, they had to pick one of these visuals. And so what instructions did I give them? Well, so the first, first thing was to have them respond um, and evaluate one of those visuals. Um, again, if, if you want to take a look at the visuals again, I'll go back. So um, some, a lot of students commented on, um, I can't judge Floyd. We had students who also commented on, on this picture this is Richard Bennett. Um, again, all these events happened during the, the, the pandemic um, and they had interesting responses. But one thing I noticed in the, in the so I, the first stage was, the, this, is, this, is, this is part one. So I, I, should, I should say that I was trying to slow students down by just introducing, um, giving them um, bits by, as, um, activities to the bits by bits. But I had a goal in mind and, and they would select one, one picture and analyze it to the best of the ability. 
And I wanted him to use slogans too, because his pictures, you see slogans in his picture. And that was a way of me introducing him to slogans. Um, um, and then we're gonna talk about agonies. Um, and so after the students, uh, after students um, provide a reflection or a perspective of, their, um, of those images, one thing I also expected them to do was to revisit the discussion board post. Um, and then give me an argument why they, um, 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 according to the criteria below. So they will talk about the purpose of the image, talk about the composition of the image, and talk about and give me an argument as well. And I, I and I, I, and this, I'm going to share the result. What I, some observations that I made. So and this. Again, I would mention that um, I don't want to make a stripping generalization, but this because um, this has not been established by any study. This is something that I observed, and this is my impression of, um, that I made. I noticed that students, especially small ESL students, struggle a lot with the context. Why they struggle with the context? Again, they had a choice to pick one image, and they were to develop the argument. Um, um, and uh, for the non-ESL students, um, I noticed that they mostly would be familiar with the, with the, with the picture, um, with the image. They oversimplified um, the instruction. Um, they um, struggled to identify the photos arguments. Um, they were experience inclined, and then the ESL were research inclined. Again, this is just some observations that I made. We're running out of time, um, and I do want to, talk about uh, images um, because we're talking about visual analysis. Uh, can anyone take a guess? Which one of these has been altered? Can anyone take a guess? Which one of these has been altered? Is it both? Is it one? Or are they? Well, because of time, I'm gonna say that uh, it's both. Okay, the left side. I gave the, I gave the answer, but nice try, uh, Soraya. Soraya, the left was altered. I also altered the right. I, uh, so I have, uh, there's, a, there's a reason for doing this. Um, why can't we say pictures worth a thousand lies? Okay, so this is a, a statement made, made by Eva Bromberger. And this is where I disagree with her. Um, she used this image, and and um, and this is she talked about this image in in our research, um, in the general visual literacy. Um, when you present this with, to students, what was your response? Well, she cited experience that um, that many students thought that this was fake. They thought that this was not a real image. And why did they think so? Well, you, the reason why they thought it was fake was because um, they have not experienced it and they just thought that um, um, because they had, they had not experienced the image and so they could not make sense of, of, of the realness or the authenticity of the image. Um, so familiarity is what she, she's, 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 she thinks it's an important criteria and um, in making judgments. So as students not to be misled, by this, but I think it's more complicated when it when it comes to visuals, um, because the other image of that you that I actually I had altered these images. I just went into Photoshop and I did something you call um, clone, and I added this else. And so, so there are four here, the three here, but this is the real image. It's two, so anyone could be misled. I mean, talking about images, but I do want to mention. Um, um, and I'm going to skip some things. Um, the main challenge of visual literacy, uh, picking and choosing the skills for instructors. Which skills are we going to focus on? Again, every, every, every class, every discipline is different. People have different expectations. Instructors have different um, 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 approaches to this. So when we talk about the outcomes, um, learning outcomes, that's going to vary. Which skills do we focus on? Um, so different perspectives. 
And so this is the main challenge in visual, visual literacy. Um, I am gonna skip this. I don't wanna focus on this for those of us, I see many of us here have a background in ESL teaching. And um, when it comes to ESL and uh, visual analysis, um, this is one thing I've noticed and from my observation too, with, from, with students, um, the problem of shared meaning. For instance, look at the picture, picture on the left. Um, what is what is Udogan, who is the Turkish president doing? Um, it could be conceived as maybe it's, it's, it's doing the pledge, uh, it's taking the pledge of the Turkish anthem, but it's actually a greeting. Um, Ivala, um, it's a great instance that is used um, by, by the Asian Turks and Ottoman. The Asian Turks, the, the Ottomans use this style as great, form of great. This was revived during the pandemic. Um, so if an instructor is sharing an image with the students, we have a problem with uh, meaning. Um, there's also another issue when it comes to, comes to the, uh, the presumption of common culture. Sometimes we instructors share images that, and, they and they think that students um, you know, there's a common culture in the classroom and students, I know we're almost out of time. Yes, somebody knows it. Yeah, so Raya, thank you for that. Um, we'll talk about this later because I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sure we, we are on time before we have a discussion. And if, if anyone wants to stay behind, there's a presumption of common culture um, in the classroom. Um, this is Heidberg and Brown. This is actually an image from Afghanistan, but many students, and this is from, from Bloomberg's article, they thought that this was Russia, but they failed to pay attention to the, um, the headgear that the, this man is wearing. They would have been able to, de to detect that this was actually um, from um, an Islamic country. They thought it was Russia. Um, and so there's a problem of common culture. And there's also another problem, uh, presumption of mental modes, that mental modes are the same um, in this, in, in this um, Another article, um, uh, Birch um, mentions that, uh, that this image, for instance, in Chinese students would have a different perception of what American bus stop means to them. So if an instructor presents this kind of image, they may think that, oh, yeah, this is bus stop in America, and this is where the journey starts and ends. But it means something different in China, but, and Chinese students responded to this differently. So a presumption of mental modes is a factor. Um, so education and learning and diversity, uh, there are challenges, but these are, these are like some skills, uh, visual literacy skills that um, Jonah Kandra from the Journal of Visual Literacy um, recommends, uh, visual reading and visual literacy skills, visual writing skills, um, um, and then the different approaches, how, what we need students need to develop. I'm trying to make sure that I'm, I'm on time, I think, because time is not. Um, I do want to wrap this up by saying that um, when it comes to pandemic visual analysis, uh, there, 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 there are different, um, there are different patterns. Of, um, that, um, so, as I highlighted in the text here, um, and this is mentioned by List. Um, we need to give students a chance to, to display their pattern of thinking. Um, and we have to slow them down in some way. We have to introduce, maybe ask them to do something. And the way I would do it is make sure that I space out the response that they're giving me to, to visual images. And here's another one from Sylvia Kara, Karastatai. Um, um, to help students take ownership of the visual images. Uh, to do this, we have to we, we, we have to um, 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 we have to use these images as, 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 a, as a support. Um, it's not going to be the main content um, that they're writing about. Um, so I, I, the way I do it is to make sure the students are writing about what is um, what is current and relevant. And fair, fair minds may disagree. Honorable minds may disagree. And I, I do want to I do want to end um, with this. Um, to try to unify um, pandemic writing and pandemic visuals. And a few quotes um, from Maso Prost, and we have one for Emily Dickinson. Uh, I know I'm out of time, um, but I, I, I don't have anything else to say other than to just end with this statement. 
Um, depending on the context, pandemic visual uh, might not even be worth more than a thousand words. As many pandemic related writings and speeches about prognosis of COVID-19 have been scrutinized under the light of reason, students need to be aware of their patterns of thinking and bias when writing about visual images. Pandemic visuals or not, by engaging re reflective or um, speculative writing. To take ownership of their object of, of the analysis, visual images, and to contribute meaningfully to civil society, students need to be able to make rational arguments and give reasons for why they think an image speaks to or enhance a rhetorical perspective. And that ends my presentation. I am sorry that I went a little bit over time. Um, I do have uh, my list of search, of my resources. Um, I want to make sure that we, I just want to, these are some questions that I had. And if anyone has any question um, or comments, I'm, I'm happy to take questions, comments. Um, I prepared one question just in case. Uh, uh, this, this is probably simple, but any comments so far? Questions, thoughts, observations? Maybe from your discipline in the arts, psychology, ESL, um, discussion with students, or maybe when you the way you do it, how do you do it? How do you when you use visuals, especially in a post-pandemic or a pandemic age? I got a question. Oh, thank you, Linda. Uh, I actually have a presentation that is coming up. Um, this is writing on the edge. So it's gonna be a different version of this because I was thinking about, I worked on this for some time. Yeah. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah, that's a brilliant because I, I, I had some interesting comments. I, I never even thought about the earthquakes. These are, these, are, these, are, these, are, these are events that are happened that we just easily miss. Instead, we just get lost in the, in the arguments of um, who's not way max or who is um, um, the latest rise in COVID stats in Florida or here and there. We've heard all this news. I'm not discounting. But, uh, was looking for you. He came a couple but, of times already. Sure, sorry. Thank you. So we will uh, end. Kushal was looking for you. He came a couple of times already to look for you. Oh, are you talking to me? Miguel? Uh, yes, uh, Isaac. What did you say? No, I'm sorry. I forgot to mute my microphone and I was uh, helping somebody else here in the office. Okay. No <laughs> I problem. apologize for that. That's okay. Okay, so I'm getting some responses. Uh, the ability to detect out of photo photos may also depend on having some understanding of motive. Which, um, who would benefit from having the photo look in such a way? That's an excellent question. I will, um, well, I just wanted to use my my audio because I, I keep, losing my text um when i was looking at the pictures that you showed earlier mm -hmm. i mean yes you can clone the deer that really doesn't seem to push it one way or another i think that there could be a potential motive in having somebody minimize or maximize the the scope of the fire on the on mm -hmm. the on the ground behind and so that's what i was looking at i wasn't looking at whether or not there were a certain number of deer in the waterway so mm -hmm. I guess I'm just saying that what are some, who, who benefits, you know, you, you, it's also, it's like a visual version of the follow the money, you know, kind of question like, yeah. um, and by the way, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go and I don't want to no sidetrack this, but I thought I would share um, a URL here uh, that New York Times, and I, I skimmed the article, so I don't know how relevant it is to this, but they were noting that Instagram seems to be picking up a lot more very text heavy memes these days. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to say about that. I'm just saying I saw this thing go fast and I meant to look at it later, but I thought it might be relevant no to you. Yeah, I, I would I would take a look at that. I appreciate that. There's a funny mind that went, you know, I was in frame for this presentation that I saw. And I, which I, which was not something I did not bring up, but um, uh, when uh, so we're talking about in about a pandemic and those seasons, there's it's it's, it's supposed to be, it goes something like your parents, your grandparents were called to walk, you were called to um, sit on your couch, 
So uh, uh. I don't know if you've heard this. So this was this is kind of like suggesting passivity in in staying home. Um, but it's, yeah, think, but it's but it but it also suggested um, um, you know that our great our grandparents who went to war um, were doing something more active, and those of us who were staying at home, you know, trying to stay safe, were just passive. Um, but I don't think it, it it has to be conceived that way. It's just it's just a mind that went viral. I just thought I should bring that up. You know, it's just yeah. I think that you, that that particular statement has some things going for it, but it also has a lot of problems with it because. Um, I mean, I realized I was just thinking about my grandparents who, you know, during World War II were stateside and doing things like engineering and running the post office and things like that. But they also got to go see their friends and family and mingle with them whenever they wanted to. They didn't have to mm -hmm. stay by themselves in their houses. So I think this, yeah, that one upping one another on who had it worse is just not doing anybody any good. But yeah, I that's, digress. That's, I digress. Yeah, that's um, no, no. It's relevant because I wanted to, I wanted to stay away from the politics of the, of the pandemic. I, I just under just look at the broader picture, like events. Um, yeah. And students oh, could for these. students yeah. could say what what I would let them opine or give their perspective on any of the images. It's just like you present an argument. So why is this so? Wow. So this is this is just like some, some suggestions because I refugee crisis is still going on. We're likely going to see a crisis with the Afghan situation. Um, that's that's already happened. It's not just, and then we have the southern border humanitarian crisis that that happened. Like it's still 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 happening. Um, I have some images of this. Uh, I just thought about this one. So these are all relevant, and this this one is the latest one. Um, I know at Oakton College we have students who many students who are refugees, many students from the Middle East. I've met Assyrians. I've met Iraqis. I've met from all over. Um, um, ESL, you know, and some of them are not also, you know, from Eastern Europe who've come here um, under, and they have a world of experience and, and, you know, what have you. And these are like eviction, uh, this also a major topic, mm -hmm. student loans and debt, uh, and, and debt. So uh, different, different topics to talk about. Um, so I'm sorry for keeping this long. Uh, some, I think we've lost one or two. But I'm, I'm gonna end this presentation by saying a huge thank you. Um, I appreciate those of you who were able to make it. Um, I have my sources and I hope you enjoyed uh, uh, this presentation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you all and good luck you. for the rest of the semester. Thank you. You're welcome, bye-bye. <laughs>